Hi, everyone. Michael Britt here. Now, I'm very proud that the Psych Files podcast has been so successful. Recently, it passed the 20 million download mark. And a lot of that success is due to my episodes on how you can use proven memory strategies to remember just about anything, from memorizing terms for a test to remembering people's names at a party or a meeting, or even memorizing speeches. It's amazing how useful these strategies are. So, I put all of these episodes into one audio course. In the most popular of these episodes, I talk about how to use images of hippos and llamas to improve your memory. So, naturally, the course is called Hippos, Aliens, and Llamas. Quickly Master the Tricks to a Great Memory. And I think you'll really enjoy the course, and it's available now on avid.fm. That's A-V-I-D dot F-M. So find out what llamas can do for your memory by going to avid.fm slash memorymaster. All one word. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of The Psych Files. Michael Britt here, your host of The Psych Files. And this week's episode is uh, entitled, Why Contradictions Bother Us So Much. Cognitive Dissonance in Our Daily Lives, episode number eight. So maybe you've heard of the term cognitive dissonance at some point in your studies or in college. Today we're going to take a look at it because a couple of things have come up recently and I want to make sure that we all make that connection between uh, these current events and this very, very interesting uh, topic of cognitive dissonance which has been studied in such detail by psychologists. Can you be pro-choice but against the death penalty. And vice versa, can you be pro-life, but in favor of the death penalty? Uh, Very interesting. Now, you may not have been asked that question, but certainly if you were in politics, you would probably be asked that question. So let's take a look at contradictions. And they really draw our attention. So a couple of contradictions you may have heard about. First one involving Newt Gingrich, He admitted to carrying on an affair while he was prosecuting President Clinton for his affair. We'll get back to that in a second. Just to make sure I hit both sides of the the political debate here, here's a couple other contradictions that have come up recently. Perhaps you've heard that Al Gore's house consumes 20 times as much electricity as the average household nationwide. Got a few facts on that to reveal in just a second, but that seemed there is a contradiction there. Here's a guy who obviously supports green energy, and why has it been reported that he lives in a house that consumes so much energy? John Kerry, during the presidential election, he, of course, also talked about how we need to reduce our dependency on oil, but it was brought up that he owned an SUV. And that caused him some problems. Perhaps you remember the way he explained that was that uh, he didn't own it, his wife owned it which I don't think helped him uh, in his case there at all. And finally, the case, uh, the situation of Mark Foley, who at the same time as he was advocating for child safety laws, was found to be sending suggestive emails to congressional pages. Okay, so four examples of this, this issue of uh, contradiction, and the term hypocrite often comes up in, uh, when we talk about these. Are these people hypocrites? Well, as usual, what we hear in the news and the facts tend to be a bit more complex. The situation with Gingrich is that if you've listened to some of the, um, some of his side of the story, rather than just the sound bites, he explains it this way that it's, yes, it was true. I was having an affair at the same time as Clinton, but Clinton was committing a felony by lying to a judge about a sexual harassment suit. And that's why Gingrich was going after him, because he committed perjury. And that's why it has nothing to do with what he was doing in his personal life. So I'll let you consider whether or not you think that is justification. And the situation with Al Gore, as reported by MSNBC, was that while it's true that his house consumes a lot of energy, he also has 20 rooms and a guest house and offices. And they buy wind and solar energy. So their power costs are more than usual, but they actually chose to buy this more expensive form of energy, which um, minimizes carbon pollution. And so if you compare it to an average household, it actually comes out quite comparable. So 
what the explanations are really isn't quite as important to us as the fact that these are situations of contradiction, and they are what psychologists would call, they, they set up a, a cognitive dissonance within us, right? When our actions conflict with what we say or what we believe in, there is an internally what we are supposed to feel is a sense of dissonance over this, a, a need to resolve. Now, a couple of um, maybe tangents here, but other places where we see this, and I think it's important. This has to do broadly, contradictions like this are, are mysterious. They're, they don't make sense. They, they, they are unexpected. And anything like that, any sort of unexpected, open-ended situation draws us in. And maybe it's because it's a, a survival instinct that we needed to be aware of anything which didn't seem to, uh, or anything which seemed to be out of the ordinary. I want to do an episode in which we talk about motivating students to read. There's been a lot of talk about paying students to read. An interesting uh, set, a couple of researchers have looked at what they call motivation to learn, which is that another alternative to paying students to read is to um, get them, suck them in, in a sense, pull them in by using the unexpected, using controversy, using mystery, uh, cultivating a desire to learn by bringing students into reading, using mystery, setting the stage for them by using things that are open-ended, because we're drawn to that. And there's an interesting um, there's an advertisement uh, by West, uh, West Virginia. The ad headline reads like this, Whatever you do, don't come to West Virginia. Now that draws us in too. Here again, the advertisers are using contradiction because you wouldn't expect that. In fact, you would probably be drawn to that. Why would they say something like that? But what they're hoping is that you will, in fact, be drawn into this. You, you look further at the advertisement to find out why they would say that. And it's, it's sort of a, a self-parody. Uh, and, and, of course, they, the ad goes on to describe why it's so wonderful to come to West Virginia. All right. So, contradiction is all around us, particularly, perhaps, in uh, politics. Let's take a look at some of the research, because it's really quite fascinating, that's been done on this whole idea of cognitive dissonance, and uh, see a couple more applications. I, I just think it's fun to, uh, to talk about. Now, the, one of the sources for this episode is a book called The Story of Psychology by Morton Hunt, and I think it's been around since the early 90s. Very interesting book, and again, I'll have a link to that in the show notes. Now here's the background for this. It is September of 1954. Leon Festinger, who's now a well-known name in the area of psychology, and his colleagues are studying a cult which was founded by Mrs. Marion Keach, although that's not her real name. Now she claimed that she was receiving messages from superior beings whom she referred to as the guardians and they were from the planet Clarion. Now, she had formed a, quite a number of believers around her, and she said that these messages came to her in the form of automatic writing. Automatic writing is when you begin writing and you're actually not purposely writing, you're, you're being uh, influenced by other forces to write what you write. Okay, so, now, there's lots of cults around. What makes this one so interesting, and why study this? Well, she told the press, she made a bold statement that on December 21st, 1954, the Guardians said that there would be a flood that would cover the entire Northern Hemisphere and everyone except for her believers would die. Now, that's a very interesting statement there. You don't see such a, such, such a uh, strong statement being made often in by cult members or leaders. So the psychologist said, well, this is, a, this is very interesting. This is a perfect opportunity to study contradictions because, assuming that Marion Keach was wrong in the world or that the flood would not come and, uh, you know, kill millions of people in the Northern Hemisphere, they wanted to be able to observe very carefully what 
these people, these cult followers would do? What would they think? How would they deal with the reality that it didn't really come true? Would they be disillusioned with Mary and Keish? So it's just this perfect opportunity to look at what would happen when, when there's a conflict between my actions. Okay, I'm, I'm studying Marion Keach, I, I am believing in her, and then what she says doesn't come true. So, um, would they be angered? Would they be embarrassed? So what they did was they decided that they would join the, the group, and they would attend the meetings and pretend to be members of the group. And meanwhile, when they had a moment to sort of uh, scoot off to the bathroom or go on a long walk, they would take notes of their experience. Okay, now, here's what happened. Word came to Mrs. Keach from the Guardians that everyone should go to a specific hill at a specific time on December 21st, and the spaceships would come and take them away to safety. Well, what happened? The answer? Nothing. So, what happened then to Mrs. Keach's followers? Did they get upset? Did they get angry? Well, in fact quite a good number of them actually walked away from this situation being even stronger followers of Mrs. Keach. Now, she explained it like this. She said that because of the strong faith of her followers, God decided not to bring the flood, and so there was no need for the guardians to come and take everyone away. Everyone was saved thanks to their faith in the guardians. Now, there were some who dropped out of the cult because of this. But many, and this is true especially of those who made the greatest sacrifices, that is, they, they sold their possessions, they quit their jobs, they became even stronger believers in Mrs. Keach. Now, you know, in a way, I think this connects to some previous topics that we've talked about. What do you do here? This is a situation that threatens your self-esteem, right? It threatens how you feel about yourself. You're either going to decide that you were a fool, maybe you were an idiot, or maybe you just say, you know, I made one huge embarrassing mistake, or you can believe that what she said is true. Because of their faith, the uh, people were saved, and Mrs. Keach is truly a great uh, leader. But that is why I made such sacrifices. That's why I quit my job, and that's why I sold everything I own, because she is such an unusual, wonderful person. Believing in that way evens things out and, and makes us feel less like a, an idiot and resolves the dissonance. So, that's the real-life study. What did they do in the lab? Now, they, they tried to recreate the situation a little bit, and I think a, sort of an interesting way, and it's now become a classic psychology experiment. How do you set up a situation in the lab where people are doing one thing, and which is, uh, you know, boring and dull, and are told to tell another person that it was really fun? Right, So you have to set up a situation, no matter what you do, you have to set up a situation in which the subject is doing one thing, but telling other people the opposite of, of that thing. There has to be a conflict between their actions and, their, and what they say. So, what did they do? All right, they had subjects come in and sit down and do an extremely boring task. They were turning pegs on a pegboard. Okay, so for half an hour, they would turn pegs a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left. They would move small widgets around. An absolutely boring task. And when the experiment was over, they were told that what the researchers were looking for was what would happen to people's motivation if they were told that the task was interesting. So... What they did at that point was, after they explained this bogus, you know, reason for the study, the subject was told, oh, you know, darn it, by the way, my research helper uh, couldn't make it in today. So could you tell the next person that this was really an interesting task? Okay, that's how they set it up. So I did something dull, but I'm going to tell someone that it was interesting. 
Now, that's probably enough to uh, set up a, a conflicting situation here. But they actually threw in uh, a little bit of a piece to the puzzle here. Subjects were either paid a dollar to tell this lie, or other subjects were paid $20 to tell the lie. So how do you think, what do you think happens? So you did something dull, and you go out and you tell the next guy, hey, this is a really interesting task. And then and the very, very last thing you do is you stop off and fill out a little survey. And part of the question in the survey is, how interesting was the task? Now, what's the difference between those who were paid a dollar and those who were paid $20? Well, the people who were paid $20 to tell the lie, in the end, rated the task as boring. And the people who were paid $1 rated it as interesting, or at least somewhat more interesting. Now, why is that? Well, the people with the $20, they experienced dissonance. They were in this situation. They said one thing. They did another thing. But they were paid 20 bucks. So they could say, uh, oh, geez, why did I do that? I was paid 20 bucks to do that. So, uh, you know, that was dull. The other people only paid a dollar had less of a justification for their lie. I mean, they were asked to lie, so there's part of it there, but they were only given a dollar. So it's still a little bit uncomfortable for them. And at the very, very end, we're more likely to say, well, you know, it, it wasn't that bad. So they resolve the conflict between experiencing some dull activity, telling someone else it's interesting, by telling themselves, you know what, it really wasn't that bad. It was kind of interesting. So that's the study. I think it's kind of an interesting study. And for those of you who are studying psychology, I'll have a, a concept map on the um, on the website, uh, www.thepsychfiles.com. So where else do we see this? Well, uh, other classic applications would be smokers. Now, smokers, of course, everyone knows about the dangers of smoking. So what do smokers do? They downplay the dangers of smoking. Now, that's kind of hard to do anymore. The other thing you can do is ignore it. You can just simply not think about the contradiction between your actions, which is smoking, and the dangers to yourself and other people. Um, the, the one that's probably more typical today would be this whole global warming thing. I mean, you're really in a tough situation if you own a gas-guzzling car and you believe in global warming and that global warming is caused by human beings and, uh, you know, their driving activities and such. So what do you do? I mean, what can you Well, you can sell the car, get yourself a hybrid, or you can downplay global warming claims. You can say it's really not uh, that big an issue or it's not caused by human activity. In one way or another, though, you are in a very uh, precarious sort of situation. here. You, you have to sort of figure out what you're, how you're going to explain to yourself and to others about um, this, this contradiction between being sort of a green person and, and uh, driving a car, a gas-guzzling car. Finally, uh, there's college fraternities and hazing. If you go through a very difficult hazing in order to become a member of a fraternity, you actually become more committed to the fraternity than someone who goes through nearly no hazing. Why is that? How do you explain that? You go through something extremely embarrassing to become a member of a group. Why does that make you more committed? Well, in part, it's explained with cognitive dissonance. You say to yourself, why did I go through all that embarrassment? Why? Because this group is so fantastic. It is worth it. You convince yourself that your actions make sense. Going through all that pain was worth it. All right. So there you go. There's a bunch of applications. So getting back to our, our opening question, can you be pro-choice and anti-death penalty. Pro-choice implies that you believe that it would be okay to end someone's life. But if you're against the death penalty because you believe it's not right to end someone's life. Right? So that would be a, um, a con contradictory situation. And you would really, you, know, you may have that, you may hold that belief. 
And no one may have asked you ever to defend that belief. But if you were in politics, you probably would be asked to defend what appears to be a contradictory situation. The other way is true, too. Can you be pro-life, which means you think that life is sacred and should never be taken, uh, but you're also okay with the death penalty? That would also be a contradiction which would raise eyebrows. And again, any sort of contradiction just makes us wonder what's going on. It draws our attention. It sucks us in. And uh, again, you may not have really thought about that. And, and as you do, or if you have, you probably would say that these are very, very different situations and there are different considerations in each, which you could say. But if you, again, if you were in politics, you'd probably have to go a little bit further than that and explain it. So it's easy to understand why politicians prepare so much for debates, because this would be tough, right? This, this would be, uh, it would be hard if you were put on the spot and unprepared to talk about this, to do so in a cogent way in about 90 seconds. All right, so uh, quote of the week comes from page 407 of the uh, Story of Psychology, the Morton Hunt book, and it is actually a quote from another book, called When Prophecy Fails, which was published in 1956 by Festinger and his colleagues about this whole uh, Marion Keech situation. So here is the quote. Suppose an individual believes something with his whole heart. Suppose further that he has a commitment to this belief and that he has taken irrevocable actions because of it. Finally, suppose that he is presented with evidence, unequivocal and undeniable evidence, that his belief is wrong. What will happen? The individual will frequently emerge, not only unshaken, but even more convinced of the truth of his beliefs than ever before. Unquote. Okay, that sort of summarizes the whole cognitive dissonance thing. One last thing. Remember to check out my memory course. You can use these strategies to get better grades on your tests, to remember people's names, and even help you to remember those jokes you keep forgetting. So you will be amazed. Avid. Dot FM slash memory master. That's avid, A V I D dot FM slash memory master. Thanks.